Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Weekly Walk. I'm your host Joshua Ingram. Uh, this is episode 7 of season 2. It is Monday, February 15th, year of our Lord, 2021. Alright, so um, I want to take some time to um, present the gospel. Um, a while back, it, so I used to go out with some brothers that would do some street preaching. And I think there's a special, I think that's a calling. I think there's a calling to be a teacher. There's a calling to be a pastor. And I would call street preaching um, an evangelist. There's a call to be an evangelist. And um, there's a unique um, anointing on those people that they they tend to have a um, incredible ability to, to memorize scripture. They're able to just quote numerous scriptures off the top of their head. They have a passion um, for the lost, a, a desire to see people come to know the Lord. And um, so it, it's not really, it, it's not where I'm called to, um, but I had a brother that was really into it. And so I just wanted to encourage him and I didn't want him to go out to the streets by himself. So I would go with him and I discovered uh, gospel signs and gospel tracks. And I thought, you know, it doesn't take a gift or a talent to stand there with a gospel sign or to hand out a track. And, and that way I can be with the brother and, and, you know, the Lord sent him out by twos. It's just, it's, it's easier to do something when you have somebody with you. Um, so I'd go out with him. Um, but I thought, you know, if I'm ever allowed the opportunity to speak, I, because I don't have that ability to, to just have a lot of scriptures memorized and, and to just, you know, spitball off the top of my head scriptures, I, I thought, man, it'd be nice to have something prepared. And so a while back, I, I wrote out um, a sermon uh, that I, I would um, like to use if, I, if I'm ever out on the streets and, and the opportunity presents itself for me to speak. Um, I thought, man, if I, if I could memorize this, this, this encompasses the totality of the gospel this would be a way to do it and and so i thought man i it'd be a good thing to do on the podcast here an, an opportunity for me to present the gospel um to anybody out there who may be listening that doesn't know the gospel that doesn't know the lord um in the hopes that uh maybe the lord would use this to draw people unto themselves i i don't know if i have any family members that listen to this or not but um I've got a lot of lost family, so um, I, I don't know. I just I thought it would be good to to share this sermon, um, this street sermon, so to, so to speak. And so I'm going to do that in the last half of this uh, podcast this week. And prior to that, um, I just want to touch on a few things that were on my heart this week. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about and. Uh, I think it was, I listened to this new podcast, or it's new to me, it's not a new podcast, but I listened to this podcast called Generations, and um, a brother of mine turned me on to it. It's, it's, they talk about current events, uh, political events, stuff like that, news events uh, from a biblical perspective. And then uh, their their main focus, though, is on public schools. Like, I, I think they, uh, or not public schools, but homeschooling. Uh, they produce um, homeschool curriculum. Uh, for people to purchase. And so that kind of seems to be the, the emphasis or the heart of their ministry. And they were talking about um, something with the public schools. It may have been the transgender issue and just how grievous it is. And it just made me think again about uh, the nightmare that exists in public schools. Like I've often considered uh, the public school to be the absolute worst place on the face of the earth. Um, every single sin that you can think of uh, not only exists in the public school, but is promoted, celebrated, and advanced and encouraged. Uh, children encourage other children. Like the public school is a nightmare. Um, a Christian parent should never, ever, ever send their child into a public school. Like, you know, you hear the excuses, oh, we, we can't afford to do anything else. We, we have to have two incomes. Um, so I, it, to me, it's like, okay, I understand that, but are we really placing monetary, um, are, are, we, are we putting finances ahead of the souls of our children? Are, are we willing to risk the soul of our children? Because it, it to me, it would be better to have illiterate children living in a van 
um, than to send them to a public school. Because in the public school, you're, you're not only going to get the homosexual agenda shoved down your throat, you're not only going to get the theory of evolution shoved down your throat, um, now you're going to get the transgender nonsense. Uh, the schools are full of, of, of uh, especially in the cities, of Muslims and Buddhists and witchcraft and um, secular atheism and... Not only that, but you're sending your children in there, like it, let's say in the middle school years, when their hormones are raging, when they're very susceptible to peer pressure, when the opinions of others matter more to them than any other period in their life. And you're going to send them in there where everybody's talking about having sex. Everybody's pressuring everybody into having sex. Everybody's pressuring everybody to do drugs. Everybody's pressuring, pressuring everybody to drink. And, and you're going to send your child in there. And then sometimes you'll hear a Christian excuse like, oh, I'm sending them in to be a light in the darkness. No, that is utter foolishness. Evil uh, communication corrupts good behavior, the scriptures say. You can't be, even a solid, born-again, mature man of faith would have a hard time uh, with all that sin surrounding them, um, would just have a hard time maintaining their walk. And you're going to send a child in there um, who, who may not even be born again. They, they're, they're probably just living off of your faith. Just, just towing the line because that's what you promote. It's not a real thing to them. It's very, for me, it's very rare um, to, to find a child that truly loves the Lord, that shows the born again spirit, that, that uh, has a passion and zeal for the things of the Lord. And, but even if they do, you're sending them in there uh, with all that hormonal issues going on and the, the susceptibility to peer pressure. Um, you're going to send them into this nightmare. You're going to send your child into this hell hole. Uh, because you want to make money, because you want a better life, you want a bigger house, you want more possessions, you want a better car. Like, like I say, it is better to, to just be poor, you know, to, to, to have absolutely nothing, um, and homeschool your child than to send them into that nightmare. I just, I, I can't see, and I'm, I'm speaking kind of hypocritically because I, I didn't have my children. I didn't get to raise my children. Uh, they were raised by their mothers, and so they were all uh, raised in a public school. And um, to be honest, I didn't fight like I, I should have for my children. Um, and, you know, that's to my shame. But I'm speaking, you know, an encouraging word to those that now have children in schools. You know, if you can do anything to get them out of a public school, you ought to. And on top of that, uh, you should never send your child to a secular college. That should not be the goal. The goal is not to give your child a good job and a good paycheck. That's not the goal. The goal is to protect the soul of your child, to have them grow up in the fear and reverence of the Lord, to love the Lord, to walk with the Lord. And secular colleges are, are uh, almost as bad as public schools. I say almost. All the same things go on in college, and, and, but there's an added element of an attack on the faith uh, but the hormones have started to settle. Children are, you know, they're now young adults. They're able to think things through to some extent and make decisions on their own. Um, the peer pressure isn't as strong in a college atmosphere. But uh, in, a, in a public school, like a middle school and a high school, it's just, there's n there is no good that's going to come out of that. And, and, and they're progressively getting worse. Now they're, they're teaching kindergartners um, about sex. Uh, they're teaching them about homosexual sex. Me and my brother just the other day, um, I don't know if you're familiar with those little libraries. They have them all over the Twin Cities here um, where people have these uh, little like mailbox type things in their yard and they fill them with free books. And so you can go and you can grab a book and or you can put a book in there. Uh, we'll do little library road trips um, where we'll hit up an entire neighborhood uh, find 15, 20 of those things, and we'll put Bibles and gospel tracts in them. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll pull all the heretical nonsense, uh, the Joyce Myers, the, the Joel Osteens, the, the, the Catholic stuff, the, the Jehovah Witness stuff. We'll pull all that stuff out of them. And then, um, during camping season, we, we burn all that crap, but we'll, we'll put, you know, Bibles and tracts in there. And then the, we have the added benefit of we're trying to find, you know, maybe the Lord will bless us and we'll find a good theological book that, that, you know, will bless us and, and we can add to our collection. But, um, 
this time we were just out on uh, Saturday, and we found a book. Uh, it, I think it was Queer Sex for Teens. And my brother was just flabbergasted about it. He's like, I can't believe this even exists. They're teaching children how to have anal sex. They're teaching children how to masturbate. And like, this is the stuff that's going on in schools. This is the stuff that is promoted in the schools by the education system. And then they have the peer pressure of their, their, their peers. Um, you know, when I was in school, it was all eighth grade on up. It was all about sex and drugs and alcohol that, and fighting. Like that was, and, and it was just constant peer pressure. There's, there's literally almost no possible way for a child to resist that because like I say, your hormones are going and, 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 and you want to have sex, you're desiring that and you're, you got peer pressure going on and you want to fit in. You don't want to be the outcast. You don't want to be picked on and everybody's pressuring you into it. Why would you send your child into that? Um, and, and then just now they're, they're going to be sharing bathrooms. You don't think perversion is going to go on in there. Um, there, there's just, it's, it's a hell hole. It is mass madness. It is the devil's playground. It is a filth cesspool is what public schools are. And there's, there's no way that uh, anybody should be sending their child into a public school. And uh, so that, that was something I was thinking about early last week. Um, it's something I think about often. Uh, like I say, it's, it's not a topic I feel like I can talk on too much because I feel kind of hypocritical. My kids all went to public school. Um, but it, it's like, it, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things. I talk about this with one of my brothers a lot is like, um, are we permitted to talk about the things we fail in? And I feel like as long as you're transparent, like, uh, why wouldn't we talk about the, how's this truth going to get out? Just because I failed doesn't mean this isn't the truth. You know, it, 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 I failed in this. Um, now, you know, please don't you fail in this either. You know, and, and so it's like, is there ground? Uh, he says it's hypocritical. And I say, well, as long as there's transparency, I don't think it's hypocritical. As long as, like, if it, it, the issue also uh, often comes up about sexual lust. Like, you know, if, if I or he struggles with sexual lust, are we permitted to counsel and encourage other brothers um, in this issue of sexual lust. And to me, I think like, uh, of course, if I see my brother struggling, um, with like, let's say, uh, pornography usage, um, am I not supposed to say anything because I also have lust issues? Um, it's not, it's not a hypocritical, you know, uh, pious looking down my finger, telling them to do something I don't do. It's not, Oh, you need to stop looking at porn. You know, it's a, look, brother, I understand the struggle. I understand the, the problems, but we need to fight against this. You know, does the fact that I also struggle with a particular issue disqualify me from offering uh, counsel or edification to another brother? Um, I, I don't think that's the case. Otherwise, like, how is anybody going to tell anybody anything? You know, we all struggle with, with you know, uh, there's no sin uh, that exists in our hearts that's not common amongst men. You know, everybody has the capacity of all sins within them. Everybody's entertained all sins at one point or another. Um, so, you know, at, at what I think the hypocrisy would come is if you were pretending like you were better than them, if you were pretending that you didn't struggle, if there, if you acted like, oh yeah, you know, that's a terrible, you know, you need to quit doing that. That's just filthy. And then in secret, you're doing the same thing. I think that's where the hypocrisy would come in. So I like with the public schools, I get it. I, I failed. Um, I didn't raise my children. You know, I didn't homeschool them. I left them to the care of their mothers. And because of that, they went to public schools. And so I failed there. But now, like, I also see the danger. And so I'm sounding the warning, you know. And I will have to give an account to the Lord for my failure as, as a parent. Um, in the meantime, you know, don't don't go down the same road I went down. Uh, so, you know, so to speak, that kind of, that kind of thing. I, I don't think there's any hypocrisy in that. If there is, forgive me. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not condemning anybody. I understand. I understand that in America, it's almost impossible for people to survive on one income. And if both parents are working, what do you do with your kids during the day? Uh, 
but you know you have to weigh that out and make the sacrifice you know i know i know brothers and sisters that are are living on extremely minimum income uh with multiple kids but but it's the dad working and the mom's at home homeschooling the kids because that's they're not going to send their kids to public school and so they're going to live a, a poor but the lord provides you know they're they're not in need or want of anything um so it's you, you know you have to decide what what's more important to you worldly comforts and and money and possessions um and 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 you know a sense of financial security or the souls of your children um but anyways uh speaking about hypocrisy um it kind of leads me into my second subject there's been a lot of talk lately um on social media about uh ravi zacharias and um he recently passed and now you know he was praised as this great man of god um, a great apologist a very intelligent man who made uh genius arguments um, against muslims and buddhists and and atheism and secularism um, and defended uh, the ideas of christianity from an intellectual apologetic standpoint and now it's been discovered that uh, he was kind of leading a secret life and um you know i don't exactly know the whole story i just know that uh, supposedly he was uh lusting um and uh, perhaps committing adultery I, I i don't like i say i don't know the whole story um because because here's where i stand on this i i was i get grieved and i i've been trying to th think this through here all week i see on social media what i perceive is a lot of christians almost celebrating the fall of this man they're making facebook posts like you know uh oh look at this guy he was supposed to be this great guy and look at he fell it's almost like they're taking joy in the failure of this man and that grieved me i was like why would anybody be happy that this has occurred why would anybody celebrate uh the exposure of this man's sins are are his sins worse than ours of course not um there is a sense and yes he was a public figure he had he was a, a, the head of a ministry so he had a leadership position and so it's it's hard to weigh these things through because um i started there was an article i think it was by like christianity today or something like that that was talking about this and i started to read it just because somebody had posted it along with their their celebration of his failure and i started to read the article and i felt just sleazy reading it i was like you know why am i even reading this you know this man has has died he's he's gone to the lord you know the lord will deal with him i don't i don't need to know the skeletons in his closet i don't need to know the the secret sins that he had that's irrelevant to me and so it, it felt sleazy and scuzzy to look at this stuff and so um like I wasn't a fan of Ravi Zacharias, so I'm I'm not coming from this biased position. I n I never really got into Ravi. I never I thought you know that uh, it, his stuff was too academic to me. It was too it was in a field that I didn't really you know I, I I'm not really zealous about uh, the particular issues that he would touch on. Um, I wasn't really a fan of his style or his approach or whatever it was. I just never really got into him all that much. Um, but I look at it and I go okay. The things he said were true. He was speaking truth. He was defending the faith from an apologetic standpoint and speaking truth. And, and I would assume through his ministry, many people, many Muslims, many Buddhists, many atheists uh, came to the faith. Uh, because because they saw the reasonable in they saw the 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 intel the intelligent arguments made by Ravi, and it it shattered these false images they had in their head and and so I be, I believe that the fruit produced by Ravi was good I believe that that a lot of good I I bet you there's people that have been saved because of Ravi Zacharias's ministry, and so I look at that and I go regardless of his failures. Like his failures are almost, it's irrelevant to me. I'm a sinner. I'm a filthy wretch. You know, 
I, I try to be transparent so that nobody can say, uh, even, you know, someday, oh, look what he did, you know, how, and then it just discredits everything I ever said. No, I try to be transparent. Like, I'm not going to hide my, my sins uh, for the most part. You know, it's, 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 I, 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 I try to be as open as possible to let people know, look, I'm a wretch. I'm a sinner. Um, I'm not qualified uh, to teach or preach or lead or, or be any sort of authority figure. Uh, but what I'm saying is true, regardless of me. I'm a, I'm a filthy, broken mess. But uh, I, the Lord Jesus Christ has saved me, has, has forgiven me, has pardoned me, has revealed himself to me, has shown me his, his glory and his majesty and his word. And I'm just telling you what his word says. I'm just telling you about him. Forget about me. Look at him. And I, I think the same should be said for all ministers. It doesn't matter about, it does matter because, and this is where it gets complicated. Like you do grieve if he, if he had molested, molested women or taken advantage of women or whatever the case may be, whatever the facts might be, um, you grieve for that. You know, you feel it's, it's, it's terrible. And you, you, you hurt for these women that were taken advantage of. And, and you're sad for his family. You're sad for his wife and his children. And it's like, man, that sucks, you know. So that part of it is grievous. And then also you look at it that a, a pastor or a leader, is a, an elder, is supposed to be above reproach. They're supposed to live lives of integrity um, so that at the outside world, so that the lost have no accusations they can make against them for this purpose. So, again, that's why I would say I'm disqualified from, from ministry because I, I'm not a man above reproach. I'm, 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 I don't meet those qualifications. And so maybe Ravi uh, should have not taken a headship leadership position um, or been transparent about his sins. But I, I understand the shame and the struggle that goes with that. So there's just this balanced approach to it. It's like it's a, it's a terrible situation. You, you grieve for the people involved. You understand that, yes, it's it's a sad, tragic thing that this public figure, this public authority figure failed um, to live above reproach. But that's between him and God. You know, he's got, I believe the man was born again. I think. I don't know nothing about him. Uh, but like I say, I, 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 his apologetics ministry probably led to the salvation of many others. Um, so, you know, I'll let the Lord deal with Ravi. You know, he's already answered for that. He stood before the Lord and, and, and had himself exposed before the Lord. That's already occurred. So why are we looking into it? Why does it, you know, he's, he's gone. He's passed on to glory. Let it be, you know, weep and grieve for the people that were affected by it. Um, but let's not, you know, people seem to just be reveling in it, like taking joy and it's just disgusting. It's like this, it's this pious, like, Oh, look what this guy did. He's a failure. You know, like, who are you? You know, you're a failure too. What if your sins were put on, on public? You know, what if your sins were proclaimed to the world? What if the imaginations of your hearts were shown to the rest of the world? Would you be comfortable? Can you stand unaccused? Are you above reproach? And I, I'd say the answer is no. It, just take your imaginations in one day. The things you fantasize about, the the anger that boils up in your heart, and project that onto a screen and let everybody see it. Are you comfortable doing that? So who are you to condemn somebody else? How are you going to take joy in the failure of another man? And and that's what it seems like is occurring with a lot of these Christians on Facebook. It's almost celebratory. You know, they post that Christianity Today article or or some other you know, article exposing Ravi and they're like, oh, he proclaimed to be this and he said he was this and, and look what did, look what he did. You know, come on. What, what about you? You know, I'm not worried about what Ravi Zacharias is doing. I am a sinner just like him. I'm the chief of all sinners because I know my own heart and my own thoughts. How am I going to make an accusation against somebody else? How am I going to, you know, uh, condemn somebody else. I don't, you know, I, 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 again, I care because of the effect that it had on others, but his own personal sins are his personal sins. You know, that's between him and God. It's, it's none of my concern. Uh, 
So, you know, it's, 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 yes, it's grievous that he was a public figure and that he had this position of authority, but still, regardless of his failures, is what he said true? That's what matters. What did he proclaim? Everybody I hear something from, it, does, it doesn't matter who it is, if you're proclaiming some truth to me, you're a sinner. You know, you're a broken vessel. But I'm not looking to that. I'm looking at what's coming out of your mouth. Is what you're saying true? I don't care about you. I don't care about what you've done or what you haven't done. Because I know me. And I know I'm worse than you. Um, f figuratively speaking or, or whatever. It's, it's, that's, we're all the same. Nobody's worse than anybody else. But I don't know anybody else's thoughts and heart like I know my own. So I see myself as the chief of all sinners. Uh, like Paul saw himself, uh, that I think every Christian ought to see themselves as worse than everybody else. Um, and that kind of humility is going to keep you in the right position when you see somebody fail. It's going to cause you to grieve, not to celebrate. I'm not happy that Ravi Zacharias fell. Um, I expected everybody to fall. Uh, I don't expect everybody to have hidden secrets that come to light and damage ministry. Uh, again, that's where the whole leadership and being above reproach comes into it. But that's none of my concern. What, uh, what was Ravi saying? What were the words coming out of his mouth? The words he was speaking, as far as I know, like I say, I, I wasn't a big fan, but I did listen on occasion, and, and he was speaking from an intellectual, uh, academic, educated perspective, but he was speaking the truth. He was defending Christianity in an apologetics way and, and using reason and logic and fact to back up the truth claims of Christianity. So those were good things coming from him. And so he was speaking truth. What he's, of course, he I, he's a sinner. Like I say, everybody is. Would I be shocked to see anybody fall? Uh, no, you know the people that are, you know, our leaders. Again, you 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 hope that they're meeting those expectations, that 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 they're they're meeting the qualifications that scriptures give of an elder. But I'm not looking to their character. To their to their uh, flawlessness as the standard of of truth, I'm looking to what's being said. Is what they are is what come. I can't. Why can't I say the sentence? <laughs> um, is what is coming out of their mouth um, scriptural and true? Is it is it biblical? That's what I'm looking to. And then it doesn't matter the source. If what's being said is scripturally true and accurate, I'm rejoicing in it and I'm accepting it and I'm loving it and I'm listening to it. And it doesn't matter who it's coming from. Of course, it's coming from a sinner. And and it, so it just was really, really uh, kind of grievous, you know, it, and it just it wasn't just one or two people. It was multiple people I saw on social media um, just had a tone of almost celebrate celebratory reaction to Ravi's fall, like they were happy about it, like they they were they couldn't wait uh, to see this man exposed, and it's like, come on, man, what about you? Let's what about your personal sins? You know, it's it's it was just uh, not a pleasant thing to hear, so. Um, that was something I was thinking about here through the weekend, um, just uh, the story with Ravi and uh, like I mentioned with the public schools earlier on in the week. And and so um, I'm going to wrap up with my own personal thoughts on those two issues. Uh, we'll, we'll stop there because uh, then I, I do want to read this sermon. Um, so uh, a sermon, so to speak, it's like I say, it's a proclamation of the gospel. And I feel like it's appropriate. I haven't done that on my podcast yet. And I, I just want to do it um, so that it's out there in the hopes that if anybody is listening that doesn't know the Lord, that perhaps the Lord would be uh, gracious and use this um, as a means to draw you unto himself. Um, so we're coming up on a break here. Um, when we get on the other side of the break, I'm, I'm going to jump into this gospel presentation. Uh, so just stick with me. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Weekly Walk. I'm your host, Joshua Ingram. And uh, we were just talking about some of the things that were on my heart this week. And uh, now I, I just want, I want to um, jump into a gospel presentation. 
and just lay it out there um, for anybody who doesn't know the Lord um, in the hopes that uh, you would come to know the Lord. As a matter of fact, let me just pray before reading this. Lord, I, I, I don't know why this was laid on my heart earlier this week to, to do this message here. Um, remove all pride and ego and um, a desire to receive applause from man from my heart, Lord. That, that pride that just ruins and taints every good thing, Lord. I pray that you would just remove that. And um, you said that uh, your word doesn't return void. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm trusting, Lord, that, that your word will move, that it will accomplish your purposes, and that you would lead um, people to it to, that, that need to hear it, Lord. I pray that, that your truth would ring forth, that you would be glorified, Lord, and made much of. And uh, that uh, if, it's, if it's your will, Lord, that you would bring lost sheep to hear this and save souls. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so I want to speak to you about the, what the Word of God says. For the Word of God is authoritative over all of our lives. Jesus said that the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. You will give an account to God at the last day, and you will answer for everything you've ever thought, said, or did in relation to the standard of God's holy word. And this is a terrifying thought beyond comprehension. For the word of God says that God canst not look on iniquity or sin. And he says that the soul that sinneth shall die. But God has made us eternal souls, so that death will be an eternal death. Unless you think some, that somehow this does not apply to you, God's word says that all have sinned and that there is no one who does good. We are all sinners. Each and every one of us has gone astray from the commands of God. We have all rebelled and done what we want instead of what God commands. Our own hearts deceive us and trick us into thinking that we're okay. The heart is deceitful above all things and that every imagination of the thoughts of our hearts is only evil continually. Even our good deeds are like filthy rags. We are full of selfishness, lust, and evil desires. We lie, we cheat, and steal. We disobey God with almost every thought, word, and deed. We live for self at the expense of God and others. Well, the word of God says that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire and that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Whoremongers and adulterers will God judge and neither fornicators or drunkards shall inherit the kingdom of God. So which of us does not fall into these categories? Who among us can say that they have not lied? Jesus said that if we look with lust, we've committed adultery in our hearts. Who can say that they've never lied or lusted in their hearts? Then what shall we do? For the word of God says that we will be judged and that we will not inherit the kingdom of God and we will all have our part in the lake of fire. What shall we do? Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. Each of us will give an account. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Every one of us is approaching death. The day of our appointment is unknown. Today could be your last day. This very moment. Those who died yesterday probably didn't expect it. They assumed that they would have today 
and it never came. That could be you. Right now, as you're hearing this, you could be approaching your final moments. And in an instance, you're going to be standing before the almighty creator of the universe, full of wickedness, sin, and rebellion. And you will need to give an account of every single sin that you've ever thought, said, or did. God will not be mocked. He is the judge of the living and the dead. And he will in no wise clear the guilty. God is just. Justice is the foundation of his throne. He will uphold justice. He will not let guilty criminals and rebels go free. He has declared that we must be holy and righteous and that disobedience is punishable with everlasting damnation. What will you do when you stand before the almighty, all-knowing, all holy God who breathes stars and galaxies into existence. Who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. And we through our sinful rebellion, have made ourselves his enemies. What will you do? There is nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to run. For his hand reaches everywhere, and his eye sees all. You are caught red-handed. How shall you escape the damnation of hell? But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. He became sin for us and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus Christ, the God-man, took on human flesh in order to suffer and die in our place. He substituted his perfect and sin-free life in place of ours. He became the propitiation for our sins. The justice of God was satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ. He paid the fine for our sins. God demanded the justice of death, and Christ stepped in and paid it all, and then rose from the dead, showing that the payment had been accepted, and that he had defeated death and the curse of the law. Justice was served through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And so what must you do in response to this sacrificial payment? Jesus said that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You who are dead in trespasses and sins must be born again by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You must be made a new creature. Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Through faith in the risen and living Jesus Christ, you can be made new. You can be resurrected from the dead. You can be born again. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do you hear these words of Jesus Christ? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. It is not anything you can do. You are a guilty criminal, condemned of justice with no escape. You are a poor and needy beggar. Only the mercy of God can save you. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You must see your need. You must see your guilt and condemnation. You must see the desperateness of your situation. There is nothing you can do to save yourself. No penance, no religion, no petitions or prayers. Only a broken and needy heart will God accept. It is not dependent on you, but it is the merciful gift of God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The gift of God. Only by his amazing grace and gift can you be saved. You must repent, turn from your sins, see your wickedness and the justice it deserves, and turn with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength to the merciful gift of God in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his Son. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you will be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Do you now at this moment hear the voice of the shepherd? Then respond, turn from your sin and follow him. Today is the day of salvation. Now, at this very moment, do not delay. This could be your last chance. This very message could be intended for you at this very moment. You must repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, there is no other way. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. There is no other way. If you hear these words today, and you harden your heart and walk away in unbelief. You have rejected the only salvation for your soul. You will die in your sins and face the justice of an all-powerful God who is angry with the wicked every day. Why will you die? Why will you reject the mercy of God? Is it because you love your sins? You love fornication and drunkenness and selfish lust and anger, but those things will destroy you. They are your enemy, both in this life and the life to come. They offer temporary pleasure, but it's a trap. It's a lure. They fade and leave destruction in their path. Broken hearts, broken homes, 
disease, financial ruin, enmity with your friends, family, and neighbors, arrest and jail, and ultimately death. That is the path of all sin. For the wages of sin is death. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Do not be deceived. The pleasures of sin are temporary. The devil seeks to steal, kill, and destroy you. He seeks to trap you with these lures, to allure you into sin. He sets a trap saying, with the food in the middle of the trap saying, this is pleasurable, come and get it. And you come and you taste and you see, yes, this is pleasurable. And then the trap springs on you. The world seeks your destruction. Your own heart and lusts deceive you and pull you towards hell. They pull you towards these traps. Flee from these. Turn to the lover of your soul. Turn to the risen and living God, Jesus Christ. Please heed my words. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may not come. Your very soul could be required of you today. In this very moment, there's an old saying that those who plan to seek God at the 11th hour usually end up dying at 1030. The illusion of more time is just that, an illusion. It's a deception. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. 150,000 people die every single day. That's almost two people every second. Two people dropping into eternity. Two people standing before the almighty star breather, giving a terrifying account of their lives. Two people having the books of their lives opened and read before God. Every thought, every word, every action being brought before the holy and living God who is angry and vengeful towards sin. When is your second up? When is it your time? Two more people gone. And two more. And two more. And two more. Time is fading away. Second by second. Your date with death and the judge of all the universe is coming. When is it up? Now please listen. A final exhortation to those of you who are his. Those who have heard the words of Jesus Christ and have been saved by faith in his sacrificial death and resurrection. Jesus said that if ye love me, keep my commandments. You must abide in his word. You must daily be feeding on the precious and pure word of God. The word of God says that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And Jesus said that if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. How can you survive without your daily bread? How can you live without the word of God? How can you be his true disciple if you're not abiding in his word? You must be in his word continually. For we are sanctified and made pure by the washing of the word of God. Let it breathe over you. Let it minister in you. Let it guide you through this dark world with its pure light. You must have it. Um, if, you, if you know, speak to somebody. If you don't have a Bible, uh, a brother or sister, or go to a church. You know, any any typical church. Um, I would recommend a Baptist or, or solid non-denominational or even like a Presbyterian. I'm sure they'll give you a Bible. Um, and, 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 and then get a Bible reading plan. Get a schedule. So please, if you're not his, do not delay. Death is coming. Eternity is around the corner. You must repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ today. And if you are his... Do not starve your inner man. Feed him with the precious word of God. 
All right, so that's what I have for you guys here tonight. As always, I appreciate you listening. I love you, and Lord willing, we'll talk to you next time.